Perfecto. And I will introduce our lovely speaker. Uh, Hallie Grant, as you might now know, is currently the project assistant for Nest Watch at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She's also worked at the lab with Project Feeder Watch, answering thousands of questions from the public about birds over the past several years. She holds a bachelor degree from uh, ESF in conservation biology, and she's held several field jobs before her time at Cornell. She currently lives in Ithaca, New York with her husband, and she's pet sitting three lovely dogs um, that may say hi at some point during the program. So take it away, Holly. Thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Um, I had three dogs laying right next to me. Now I've got one that's really demanding pets right now. So I'll try to do this one handed for a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start my PowerPoint here. Let's see. I'm working on some weird screens. All right, Allison, can you give me a thumbs up if it looks okay? Yeah. Perfect. All right, so um, tonight I'm going to talk to all of you about birds in your backyard. Um, I'm sure some of this information might be familiar to some of you. Um, some of it hopefully will be new, um, but let me see here. We've got um, an, my basic agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, I'm going to talk about what makes a yard wildlife friendly, what you can do to improve yours. Um, how to attract birds with feeders and some resources that we have to help you uh, do that. Attracting birds with nest boxes, again, more resources um, and a few tips for general birding if uh, you're new to it or um, you're not sure how to get started. We've got some more uh, helpful uh, tips on our websites that, that I'll introduce to you. And then I can um, share my screen to, to share some of those interactive um, websites when we finish up. Let me see here. And one more thing I wanted to say when everyone was sharing their their species, I'm sure most of you have heard this. Um, we did have the tufted duck on Cayuga Lake um, a few weeks ago. I'm not sure if it's still there. And um, a harlequin duck, uh, uh, immature male that is slowly coming into his adult plumage. So those are some pretty cool birds that I saw recently. All right. So to start off, uh, if you're not familiar, the Cornell Lab is a nonprofit institution that's part of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, so right at the bottom of Cayuga Lake. Our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Um, we do have some departments that deal with whales and bioacoustics and um, you know sounds that the animals make and a whole bunch of other um, things, but we're mainly focused on birds. We have a visitor center as part of our main building and miles of hiking trails in the surrounding property. And just a side note, we did recently, I think it was um, a little over a year ago, we recently acquired 80 more acres um, that are just off to the east of our current property. Um, so there'll be some new trails coming soon. Uh, the lab is small and it's also large at the same time. Uh, we have over 200 employees, but a lot of groups and projects made up of smaller teams. So for example, as Allison said, I work for Nestwatch um, and Nestwatch is really just run by me and our project leader. We've got a couple of programmers and web developers to help us out with our, with our website and our app. Um, but you know, day-to-day -day operations, it's just the two of us. Our visitor center um, is a great place to visit. Um, if you haven't been there, uh, we're open most days. Uh, I think just a couple of um, Cornell holidays or the, the days were closed. The trails outside, however, which are great for, for bird watching, are accessible at any time, um, mainly open dawn to dusk. Uh, our property is a bird sanctuary though, as you might assume. So um, we just ask that visitors leave their pets and bicycles at home. Um, stay on trails, respect wildlife, you know, all the good stuff. So here's a really quick um, trail map of our current trails. And then if you look here on the right, um, the blue and pink trails on the right there, um, our new property is to the right of that. So that's gonna be some really nice open habitat, um, might get some meadowlarks, bobolinks, um, that you know, open field kind of stuff. All right, so how can you make your own backyard a bird sanctuary? Um, if you'd like to attract birds, there's a lot of things that you can do um, to your own backyard. 
So um, I know you guys were talking about safe win or, uh, window strikes earlier. So making sure that your windows are safe. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced birds hitting your window. Uh, birds often make the mistake that the reflections in the glass, you know, it reflects trees and open space. They reflect, they make, they think that that's a good place to fly. Um, so screens on the outside usually help break up that reflection. But if you have windows without screens, um, glass doors, decorative windows, you know, that kind of thing. Um, consider adding materials that break up the reflection on the outside. Um, we found, you know, netting or special stickers are great options. Um, the lab also just got a whole bunch of Acopian bird savers, which are, it's basically um, uh, like paracord space, uh, strung vertically on the windows spaced every four inches or so. Um, so we've definitely experienced I haven't heard any birds hitting the lab windows since we've had them installed. So there's good stuff there. Um, another good option is reducing your lawn. Um, carefully manicured lawns often consist of just a handful of grass species. So you can consider going a little bit longer between mowing to help um, help that grass grow a little bit longer, uh, keep the soil a bit more moist um, and give a little bit more space for insects. Um, and maybe letting some of those areas of your yard grow wild or, um, you know, letting some weeds grow in some spots because weeds after all are native, often native species um, that can be helpful to wildlife. You can also expand your garden with native species as well. Um, the more diversity in plant species that you have, the bigger the diversity of insects, birds, and other organisms that will be attracted to that. So looking at this a different way, consider that birds and insects prefer certain plants as foods or materials for nesting. So the more options you have, the more likely you are to attract a variety of species. Another thing that can help here is to not rake leaves up in the fall. The leaf litter helps provide habitat for a variety of animals, including prey for birds like wrens, like the Carolina wrens that were at um, your feeder there, sparrows and towhees. All right, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, something else that can be a real benefit to birds is to use native plants, trees, and shrubs in your garden. Uh, native species, as opposed to non-natives, have been in our region for a millennia, um, co-evolving with our native birds. So you may find that birds are more likely to come to crab apple, serviceberry, or mulberry trees rather than a berry-producing shrub that is native to another continent. Um, mainly just because they have less experience with that species and because it's possible that those plants might not have the, you know, they weren't um, co-evolving to develop those nutritional needs. Um, you know, the birds, put another way, uh, those non-native plants aren't going to be quite what's the best for the birds that are native here. Native plants also foster healthy and native insect populations, and insects are a critical food source for birds, especially during the breeding season. I know a lot of songbirds, um, we get questions about food for songbirds a lot um, in the summertime, the spring and summer, and it's I think it's only one or two finch species that really feed seeds or plant matter to their young. Um, most songbirds are feeding insects, um, a variety of insects. So it may go without saying for the last one, but a wildlife friendly yard is one that's not treated with any kind of chemical that has the intent to harm organisms. So pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides, um, there might not be directly targeting birds, but they target insects, arthropods, and plants that go to seed um, and other natural food sources or nesting materials that the birds take advantage of. It's hard to say um, how those chemicals might indirectly affect birds, but um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the story of the bald eagles and the DDT pesticides. Um, in short, pesticide runoff from agricultural crops flowed into nearby streams where it accumulated in the fish this way in there. The DDT then accumulated in eagles and other raptors that ate more and more of those fish. Um, as a result, the eagles and the other raptors didn't die, but when it came to reproduce, they could only lay eggs with very thin, weak shells. Um, they broke easily and led to a widespread population crash. So the good news is we're, you know, we've banned DDT and those species are all doing a lot better today. Um, and it's important to note here too, this is something I kind of added um, today, that there are pesticides out there that are, you know, they're advertised as safe or organic um, and they can still be harmful. So you know, considering what safe and organic mean in this context, um, for example, a pesticide could be safe for humans, you know, but 
it might devastate a bird who um, has a smaller body size and, you know, the same amount of chemical might be devastating to them, whereas humans can handle um, small, small, you know, chemicals in small amounts. Um, and the definitions of organic, according to Merriam-Webster, like a dictionary, is a little bit different than the way that the USDA um, def defines organic. There are still some pesticides that fall under the organic umbrella. Um, I'm not saying that it's totally, you know, never use them. I'm, you know, it's it just, if you can avoid it, that's a, that's a good thing. All in all, um, it's just a good idea to do some research before you purchase products like that. Um, all right, so the last page uh, showed some strategies that are just overall good practices for a wildlife friendly yard, but these three options are especially helpful if you're looking to attract birds specifically. So no one should be surprised with the list, right? Uh, bird feeders are one of the best ways to attract birds. Um, I'll go into more details of this in a minute, but feeding birds encompasses the act of filling feeders with suet, seeds, or even putting out fruit, jelly, or sugar water um, in an area that's easily accessible by birds and sometimes squirrels. <laughs> Bird baths um, can also attract birds just as well as food. Um, so if you've got ordinances in place that are preventing you from putting food out, um, you can try a bird bath. Um, we often recommend using a dripper or a sprayer to help entice the birds. Uh, you can make a homemade version of a dripper by poking a small hole in a bucket and then filling it and hanging it above the water basin. So it's slowly dripping out. That water's slowly dripping from the bucket down into the basin. Um, and that movement can, can help attract the nearby birds and make it a little bit more uh, more attractive. And heated bird baths this time of year can especially be especially useful so you don't have to worry about you know chipping out the ice every day. Um, and of course we recommend uh, refreshing that water every day to keep it fresh and clean. You know using a bird bath that's easy to clean um, usually made of uh, glass or ceramic or something that's not porous is probably going to be helpful too and that way if it ever grows algae or something you don't have to sit there and, and scrub for hours with a brush. And of course, nest boxes. Um, these are also bird bird houses. So the terms are interchangeable. Um, they provide extra nesting space for birds, um, especially in areas where cavities might be harder to find. Um, you know, big lawns or um, areas that don't have a lot of trees uh, can definitely benefit from from nest boxes, especially. And again, I'll get into this a little bit further in the next few slides. So feeders, um, as you can see, bird feeding is pretty popular in the United States. Um, over 59 million people feed birds. And that was according to a study done a couple of years ago. Um, so there's probably more now. Uh, feeding birds is okay. Um, seems like a silly phrase, but we do get a lot of questions um, asked, you know, can I feed the birds? Is it okay to feed them? Am I gonna, you know, be interrupting their natural processes? Um, in general, no. Um, if feeders were harmful, we'd expect feeder bird species populations to be doing poorly compared to others. But um, despite the overall declines that a lot of people, you know, have uh, all the papers have shown in the last few years, feeder bird species are doing a little bit better than non-feeder birds. You know, there's still declines overall, but the feeder birds are doing okay. Um, there's a lot of articles out there that talk about the merits of bird feeding, um, but there's no evidence we're aware of that suggests feeding birds is harmful, um, as long as those feeders are being cleaned regularly. Um, this is kind of important if you're feeding birds, you wanna make sure that you're not uh, helping diseases spread. Um, there's no way to completely prevent that, but you know, uh, cleaning a feeder one to two times a month, I think our, our recommendation is once bi-weekly. Um, making sure you remove all the little crud and the little pieces of gunk that are in the corners, um, scrubbing it clean, and then soaking it in a weak bleach or vinegar solution, something like, um, you know, one to 10 ratio uh, should help. And I did have a little note in here about the um, avian flu uh, outbreak. Um, we do have a web page that I can share in the chat later uh, that is regularly updated on this. Um, right now, it's not necessary to stop providing food for wild birds unless you also have domestic poultry. Um, the key intervention here is to keep songbirds away from the poultry. Um, it's less important to keep songbirds away from each other. Um, and avian flu has impacted, you know, raptors and shorebirds and waterfowl a little bit more than they have songbirds. Um, 
you know, and that said though, um, I'm not a disease pathologist or anything like that. So um, if you've got state or local guidance that becomes more restrictive, um, then I would definitely make sure you follow that. And again, I'll, I'll share that link later um, for that web page that we have. It's pretty informative and it's got um, answers to some common questions that, that the Cornell lab has received um, about the avian flu. And as I said before, just to be a bit of a myth buster, uh, feeders do not prevent birds from migrating, nor do birds become dependent on your feeders. Uh, migration is triggered by day length and other hormonal cues, and it's important to remember that birds use feeders as a supplement to their natural diets. Um, they don't depend on the feeders for survival. Birds do tend to go for easy food sources, though, and that give them the best nutrition. Um, and so if there's abundant natural food, they tend to take advantage of those food sources while they're available. And that's why you might not see many birds at your feeder in the fall, which is when plants and berries are available. You know, a lot of um, uh, it's the harvest season, right? A lot of a lot of um, plants are, are going to seed, that kind of thing. Um, but when those natural food sources are scarce or covered up by snow or, you know, hard to access, um, you'll likely see a lot more birds taking advantage of the easy pickings that are at your feeders. Some folks, um, you know, that's one of the biggest things that we get a question about when I worked for Feeder Watch was, you know, it's migration. I took my feeders down. What else can I do to help? And it's like, yeah, um, birds probably appreciate feeders up during that time because they just finished or they're gearing up for that big flight that they're making from, you know, North America down to South America or wherever they're flying. Um, they want to beef up a little bit, right? They want to make sure they've got the food reserves or recover from all that they lost during those flights. Um, so having feeders up in the migration months um, can be especially helpful. Uh, peanuts, suet, thistle, and sunflower seeds, um, those four, are uh, they, they pack a punch. So um, if you're looking to get the most bang for your buck, those, those seeds are going to be ideal um, to provide to give those birds the, the energy they need. So a couple of tips if you're providing feeders. Um, if you've just put out new feeders or switched up the kind of food you offer, don't be worried if you don't see birds visiting immediately. Um, sometimes it can take a few weeks for the birds to find the feeders or to just get used to new food types. Um, you know, I have a couple of feeders at my house. I've got one that's full of sunflower seeds that birds love to come to. And if I put something new out on the other, the other hook, um, it might take the birds a little while to investigate, see if it's something good, see if it's something they they want to continue coming back to, um, you know. And then if you're, you know, have never had food in that area and you're putting out a brand new feeder, um, that can, like I said, take a couple of weeks for the birds to even find it before they start to investigate. But just hold on, they'll be there eventually. Um, and different species uh, tend to have different food preferences too. So if you've always provided thistle or nyer seeds, but you're now you're putting out um, suet, you can expect to see some pretty different species visiting. Uh, thistle and niger usually attract finches and smaller birds, um, and suet can attract a variety, you know, chickadees, woodpeckers, um, all sorts. Um, if you'd like to encourage a lot of different species, then offering a variety of foods and feeder types is probably the best way to go. There's a lot of open space um, between your feeders and the nearest tree line or the shrubs um, that are in your yard. Uh, adding a brush pile can help give the birds a little bit more confidence to cross that large expanse without the fear of predators. Um, so brush piles can be made out of gathered branches, plant stalks, old uh, Christmas tree branches if you cut them off the, the bowl, um, or other, other materials like that. Um, they give the birds a protected place to hide or to rest where, you know, hawks or feral cats can't um, reach down and through there and get them. Um, I recommend placing the brush piles close to the feeders, but not so close that the um, predators like the cats or raccoons could surprise the birds that are feeding on the ground beneath your feeder. So you don't want to have a, a pile right at the base, maybe four or five feet away so that um, the birds have a little bit of uh, awareness of the dangers that are nearby. And speaking of predators, um, if your feeders are mounted on a pole, um, you might be interested in adding a cone or a stovepipe baffle, which um, they're designed to help prevent climbing mammals, uh, such as raccoons, squirrels, and chipmunks from accessing the bird seed. Uh, there's no, you know, 100% guaranteed way to prevent squirrels from accessing your feeders. Again, another really common question, um, but this can be a really great start. Uh, just make sure it's installed high enough uh, because squirrels have a pretty impressive vertical jump. Um, I've seen them jump 
very high, just from the bottom, right up on top of my, my cone baffle. I'll re reiterate that native plants can be a great substitute for feeders, um, especially if you live somewhere where feeders are not allowed and you know you don't want to deal with a bird bath. Um, sunflowers, cone flowers, trumpet vine, um, a lot of other native plants um, can be, you know, they provide seeds, they provide nectar, um, they're attractive to birds just as well, and uh, can help save save you a few bucks um, if you're worried about buying seed and the birds are eating it. Uh, eating pounds and pounds of it. <laughs> and lastly, um, as Allison pointed out, I did used to work for Project Feeder Watch, um, which is one of several citizen science programs that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology runs. Um, participants in Feeder Watch watch their feeders and count birds according to our protocol. We've got special instructions, so it's a little bit different than eBird, um, and then record the participants record those counts on our website, and the data gets added to a large database that's um, openly accessible to scientists to use in their research. Um, so we're going on, I think, the 36th year, 36th or 37th year of Feeder Watch. Um, so lots of data. There's somewhere just under 30,000 participants all over the U.S. and Canada. Um, you sign up, you get a cool kit uh, poster, um, and it's a pretty interesting community. Um, I definitely recommend it if uh, folks are interested in contributing to science uh, right from your own home. And that is um, a project that runs uh, from the 1st of November through the end of April. And you can sign up anytime. Um, even just submitting one count is valuable. So even if you sign up in the middle of the, the season, you do it once and you're like, you know what, maybe it's not for me or maybe you're too busy to, to participate again. Um, it's totally fine. It's definitely valuable data, um, but it can take as little as 10 to 15 minutes um, two days a week. And like I said, that's uh, the most you can participate is once a week. All right. Um, I have the website here, feederwatch.org. Um, you can go there for more information. And there's a join or renew button that you can use to uh, sign up. And like I said, do that anytime. Um, we're happy to, to get your, your kit out to you. Um, one of the great things about Feeder Watch is that there are tons of free resources. So um, as I was alluding to earlier, um, one of the best ones is called the Common Feeder Birds Tool. Um, try to share a link in the chat, perhaps. Um, this tool, excuse me, lets you um, use filters. So you can filter down to your region, the kind of feeders that you have in your, in your setup and the food types that you use. And then it'll show you all the species that are, could potentially come to those feeders. Um, I really like to use it because you can see all, you can uh, you click the button to see all of the species. And if you click on one that you're like, oh, you know what? I've never seen a red-bellied woodpecker at my feeder. What do I need to do to get him to my feeder? You click on the, the picture of the bird and it'll show all of its preferences on the next page. So, you know, then you'll learn, oh, okay. If I put out a suet or if I put out, um, you know, orange halves, something like that, then I have a better chance of attracting a red-bellied woodpecker because that's the foods that they, some of the foods that they really like to eat. Um, it's a really great tool when you're trying to decide how to set up your um, your feeders and also if you're really looking for that target bird. Um, again, if I have time at the end, I'll try to show you how that works. Okay, uh, nest boxes are the next one here. Um, as I mentioned previously, nest boxes are um, a great option for attracting birds to your yard. Um, there's a lot of different species that use nest boxes, um, and they've been shown as being successful even in more urban areas. Um, might not have, might be as successful as in the rural areas, but um, we've definitely had some folks that live in suburbia. They've got small backyards, but they've got birds in their bird houses. Um, nest boxes are meant to mimic natural cavities, so they only attract cavity nesting birds. Um, you won't find cardinals or hummingbirds or goldfinches um, choosing to nest in nest boxes because they build their nests in open cups in trees, like on the branches um, or in shrubs. So, you know, uh, we definitely have had questions of um, folks asking how they can attract a hummingbird to a box. And I have to say, sadly, it's not possible. <laughs> So um, the project that I work for currently is Nest Watch. Um, it's a sister project to Feeder Watch almost. Um, Nest Watch participants monitor bird nests 
They record what they see in the nest and they report it to us at nestwatch.org. Um, like Feeder Watch, Nest Watch data are added to a large database accessible sci by scientists. And we're hopefully that in the next few months, we're going to be able to make that data open access. So um, right now you can request us, request that data from us. Um, and we'll be happy to give it to you, but we're hope we're working on getting that. So all you have to do is click and download um, an Excel spreadsheet with all that data in it. Um, it's important to note uh, birds in their nests are federally protected. I'm sure everyone here has heard of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, so nest watch participants are asked to review and follow our code of conduct um, and take a really easy quiz. Um, it's only 10 questions and it's, you know, you're not going to really pass or fail. It's just meant to help you you know, kind of drill in your mind what what our um, recommendations are to reduce the disturbance on birds that are nesting, um, while still also allowing you to collect uh, good records of the bird nest. So in short, we recommend checking on a nest only one to two times per week um, at most, keeping the visits short, um, not touching the birds or the nest unless you have the proper permits, um, and giving it a lot of space otherwise. A typical nest check lasts less than a minute and should be enough to get a quick count of the eggs or the young before, you know, moving on and um, if you have another nest going over to that one instead. Um, or maybe taking a picture so you can you can count later. Because birds must stay in one place to build their nest, incubate eggs and raise young, they're typically more susceptible to predators during this time. So because of this, we suggest leaving the nest uh, via a different path than the one you took to the nest. So um, it's like your path walks by the nest rather than um, a dead end trail that could lead uh, predators with particularly good sense of smell uh, right to that box that might be full of eggs or young. Um, it's also a good idea to add predator guards, like I talked about on a, a slide, uh, one or two slides ago, the stovepipe baffles, the cone baffles, um, those are great to add to poles that you have a nest box installed on as well. Um, that can also help prevent snakes in some cases. And, um, you know, oh, and uh, I was going to say snakes and raccoons, just like the feeders, but also um, one of the a nest predator that not a lot of people think about is also a chipmunk. <laughs> Chipmunks have been known to prey upon nests as well. Um, and of course, you know, there's, a, a again, no 100% certain way to prevent predators from accessing a nest, but we, there's definitely some ways to help prevent it, um, to do your best to, to make it as hard as possible. And I've got here on the on the screen some recent research by um, the project leader Robin Bailey and our direct or our uh, center director David Bonner. Um, they did research on the predator guards, and it showed us the boxes that had predator guards showed a success rate six point seven percent percent higher than boxes without guards. So it sounds like a small percentage, but that's actually pretty good in the nesting world. <laughs> um, unfortunately. You know, it's something that's kind of invisible to a lot of a lot of folks unless they're they're sitting there and monitoring a nest from beginning to end. But nest bird nests do fail fairly often. Um, it's it's pretty it's unfortunate, but you know it's a fact of life, right? Circle of life. So six point seven percent increase is is pretty pretty phenomenal. Uh, birds can benefit from the extra nesting space that nest boxes provide, especially in human modified habitat. Um, like I said earlier, backyards and landscaped areas that might not have a lot of trees or shrubs in them, um, especially those yards, but they can still be, they can still benefit um, birds and yards that do have trees too. But, um, you know, a big wide open space is not going to have cavities for birds to nest, right? So the more nest boxes you have in that area, um, the more likely you are to to attract a bird there. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, only cavity nesting bird species will be attracted to nest boxes. Um, and of all cavity nesting species, there are a smaller number that can be reliably attracted to a man-made box. So um, common species that use nest boxes are bluebirds, chickadees, tree swallows, uh, wrens, some owls, and wood ducks. Um, but you know, we might have um, we have nest box plans on our website for pileated woodpeckers and northern flickers, but we haven't had ev any evidence that other woodpecker species that are native to our area, you know, downies, harries, um, red-bellied woodpeckers, we haven't a reliable um, uh, data showing that those species are attracted to, to nest boxes. So, you know, it's kind of a 
a trial and error in some cases, but um, the species that are listed on our website, I'll, I'll give you the link in a minute here, um, they do reliably uh, use nest boxes. Um, and just because you place a nest box in your yard uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee the bird is going to live there. <laughs> um, it's important to place the box in the right habitat. Um, for example, chickadees uh, prefer nest boxes in forested areas, bluebirds like open meadows or open woodland, um, and wrens like to have cavities and shrubby edge habitat between the two. Um, so if you've got a little hedgerow between your yard and your neighbor's yard that's full of shrubs and short, shorter uh, scrubby areas, that's probably where you're going to find a wren nesting. And it's important to have the proper sized entrance hole. Um, you can exclude larger species from boxes based on the entrance hole size. So invasive species like house sparrows and European starlings, um, they compete for nesting space with a lot of our native birds. Uh, and having the proper entrance hole size for your target bird can help deter the invasive species from taking over that nesting space. Um, the unfortunate thing is I think house sparrows, the smallest they could get into I think is um, an inch and a quarter. Um, so if you're getting bluebirds, there's a high chance that the house sparrows will be able to use those boxes too. But um, chickadees and house wrens, which can fit in boxes as small as one inch in diameter or one and one eighth, um, you can pretty much guarantee you that it'll be too hard for the sparrows and the starlings to get in there. Unless, of course, you've got a, a squirrel uh, making that entrance hole a little bit larger than you wanted originally. <laughs> Um, on the NestWatch website, we have um, a great tool to help you if you're looking to add a nest box to your yard. Um, it's called the Right Bird, Right House tool. This tool allows you to filter for your region and your local habitat, um, and it'll provide a list of cavity nesting species that are most likely to nest near you and which will also be attracted to a man-made structure. Um, then you click on the species to learn this preferences, get a downloadable construction plan to build the nest structure, um, and to learn uh, the box placement tips for when you're done. So, um, you know, the height of the box, the orientation, um, sometimes the orientation matters, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the spacing, if you're looking to attract more than one of the same species, how far apart do those boxes need to be? It's different for every species. Um, so there's a lot of interesting information there. Um, we try to provide you as much as we can, but if you've got additional questions and you use that tool, you can always email us and we're happy to, to, to help. Um, also on that tool is not just cavity nesting species. There are some that are attracted to man-made nest structures, um, but it's species like osprey or, um, you know, osprey we have an osprey platform plan. So you can attract ospreys if you've got the right habitat. Um, nest cones for morning doves or great horned owls. Granted, the owls have a, a large, much larger nesting cone than the doves. Um, but as I said, you know, we've got, a, I think about 60 species right now um, that you can choose from to try to attract to nest in your yard. And um, it's also a really great tool if you're like, you know what, I don't want to build my own, but I know of a store where I can buy them, or maybe you know a woodworker, you can use those plants to help you um, make your decision of, you know, where to buy it or um, whether the plan, that the next box that you're looking at on the website is actually the one that you want. Um, we all know there's tons of decorative nest box, uh, yeah, birdhouses and nest boxes out there. You can buy them at, you know, craft stores. You can buy them um, at some big box stores. Um, and they may look really pretty from the outside, but they're not always the best for birds. You know, sometimes they're too small, sometimes um, they're painted or use, they use, um, you know, chemical laden wood. Uh, so it's important to, to look at some of the recommendations we have and then um, use that when you're, when you're making that purchase decision. I'll go over this uh, really quickly, kind of um, like I was saying before, uh, what makes a nest box good? You can see a few options here. Um, the box on the left is what I would consider a, a good nest box. Um, there's a lot of different styles out there, so no one style is going to be the best to attract birds. Um, you know, for example, I think there's four or five different uh, box styles that attract bluebirds. You know, we don't say one is better over the other, just um, certain features can be helpful. 
So a sloped roof to help the rain fall off, um, entrance holes the right size, the door opens so that you can clean it out at the end of the year. And there's not a buildup of uh, gunk inside. Um, and it's made with untreated wood. Um, usually cedar or pine is what you can buy um, from stores like Lowe's or Home Depot. But, um, you know, again, trying to mimic their natural nesting habitat as much as you can. The um, ones on the right here, <laughs> they're not necessarily bad. They might attract a bird, but, you know, is it really a good home for them? That's the question. So um, in the middle there, that really brightly painted one, you can see it's a little bit small. Um, there's three holes, which isn't really conducive <laughs> to a nest. Um, you know, whether it lets in a little bit too much air or um, there's room for predators to get, you know, more spaces for predators to get inside. Um, contrary to popular belief, perches. Um, perches seem almost, you know, synonymous with a birdhouse, but they can actually give a little bit of a leverage for flying predators like um, jays or crows or, um, you know, even small mammals that gives them a little bit extra, like a leg up to get into the hole. Um, the box isn't securely, uh, just securely attached to the tree, so you're going to want to make sure that um, whatever you mount your nest box to, it's securely attached so that it doesn't fall off or, or um, you know, fall, you know, tilt to the side during the nesting season. You don't want those eggs rolling out. Um, a few other things we've got on there. It's painted. Again, paint is not necessarily a bad thing, but those bright colors could attract predators, um, make it more visible. And, you know, depending on the kind of paint you're using, you want to make sure that if you do have to paint a box, you know, maybe white or some camouflage color, it's only on the outside and you've given it plenty of time to off gas any chemicals that are in those paints. Um, never paint the inside of the box. Um, thin wood can also be bad. You want to make sure that, um, you know, it's properly insulated against extreme temperatures. Um, a typical box that, or sorry, a typical board you might get from a, a lumber store, I think is about one inch. Officially it's one inch, but I think in reality, if you measure it, it's like three quarters of an inch. Excuse me, that's usually um, a decent thickness. Um, and again, these two on the right here, they're really, really small boxes. I don't know if you can tell the size from the pictures, but the one on the bottom is maybe three or four inches tall. <laughs> we had someone ask us if it was ideal for hummingbirds. Again, hummingbirds don't nest in nest boxes, um, and a box that small is probably not even going to fit um, a chickadee, which is one of the smaller uh, cavity nesting species. And of course, they have perches. Let's see. Yeah, and you know, you think about too, sure, maybe some of these smaller boxes could hold eggs, but when those eggs hatch and those birds grow and grow and grow, you know, it's not going to fit them. So here's a few examples of this space. Um, you can see it really well on this chickadee nest, right? Um, these are all shots of different nests. So it's not the same nest in progression, but it's the same size box. Um, so there isn't a lot of space needed for those nine eggs on the far left. Um, but you know, this is it, middle picture is maybe just a couple of days after hatching. So they're already pretty large. And then on the right here, they're near that fledging stage. Um, they're almost adult size by the time that they, they leave the nest. So that's a lot of growing that those birds do in just about two weeks. And just to be clear, the, the image on the right only has six young, so there's not all nine um, in that right-hand picture. So imagine three more birds in that nest, right? <laughs> These are a couple of common questions that I've gotten um, as a nest watch assistant. So I manage the inbox. Um, we get tons of questions every year, but these are pretty common ones. Um, so I'm going to dip into them one by one. One, what should you do if you find a baby bird? Uh, what should you do if a bird build a, builds a nest in a weird spot on your property? Maybe it's not ideal. Maybe you've got one built on a, um, you know, on a vehicle that you need to move. And then I'll dip into a couple of uh, myths. So what do you do if you find a baby bird? Um, ideally, you're not going to touch it unless you really absolutely need to. Um, so don't feed them, don't give them water. Uh, the first thing to figure out is whether you have a nestling or a fledgling. So the vast majority that bird, uh, that people see are fledglings, like this bird on the far left. It's a baby robin. Um, those birds don't need our help. 
their parents are probably nearby. Um, you know, it looks like they can't fly very well, but that's pretty true of a lot of birds that are freshly out of the nest, right? They're hopping around, they're trying to to learn how to fly, but you know, it's their first day, it's their first couple of days. They don't know fully how to fly yet. Um, so you see a small bird like that, back away, make sure it's, you know, there's no immediate dangers um, and try to let it uh let it do its own thing. Keep your pets inside, make sure it's it's got its space. On the right hand side, these three pictures um, are all nestlings. If you do see the nest nearby, um, you can put the bird back in its nest as quickly as possible and gently. Um, if the bird is injured or you can't find the nest, then your best course of action is gonna be to call um, a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, and I say call because you wanna make sure you call the um, the office to make sure they can they're open to make sure they can they kind of got a heads up of what's coming their way and um, you know they can offer advice over the phone too so they're definitely definitely the best people to to talk to and if you're ever confused about what bird you're seeing in general a fledgling's got most of its feathers a nestling has got a lot of open, a lot of skin showing these ones on the far right here um, you can't see skin on them immediately, but they're still in the nest. There's there, there's some bare patches that aren't visible in this photo. Um, so when in doubt, call a rehabber um, and try to give the bird a lot of space. All right, birds in inconvenient places. You can see this photo of a robin that built its nest on a hose. <laughs> Maybe we're not using hoses in uh, you know late March and early April, but um, come May, maybe you've got to start washing your car, whatever you need that hose for, watering your garden. Um, so what do you do, right? Um, if the nest has eggs or young, it's federally protected. So that Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects nests when they're active. They've got, you know, live young um, eggs, the birds coming back and forth to the nest. Um, so the best, the re really the best advice I have here is to be proactive, right? Regularly check your grill, your wheel wells, your wreaths on your door, um, trailer hitches, boats, all of that good stuff for the nests um, when breeding start breeding season starts, um, especially if you anticipate using that equipment. Um, if you find, if all you find is nesting material, there's nothing in it yet. Um, that means there's no eggs, there's no young, you know it's not being used. Um, you can just remove that nest, that that stuff. Um, I would you know keep an eye on the area for the next few days because birds can be pretty determined to rebuild, um, maybe even in the next couple of hours. <laughs> uh, but federal laws will protect that bird nest as soon as that first egg is laid. Um, and you're gonna wanna, you know, once the egg is laid, it might take usually about a month um, sometimes a little bit longer for the bird to go through that entire process. Um, so if there's eggs or young in the pres in the nest, the best course of action is to just leave them be um, and try to delay your use of whatever um, that material is. Most birds, like I said, uh, complete in about a month or so, and um, it shouldn't, uh, sorry, it takes about a month to, for them to finish that. Um, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Um, and once the, the young have fledged and the nest is empty again, you can go ahead and remove it. Um, your first thought might be to move the nest to a nearby area, um, but birds often don't recognize their own nest, even if it's just a couple of feet away from its original position. Um, the worry here is there's just a, a, a large uh, risk of abandonment. So um, all they see is that their nest is not where they left it. And there's a strong potential that, um, you know, maybe a predator got it, you know, the birds are kind of thinking, all right, it's not here anymore. All right, I'm going to go restart somewhere else. So, um, you know, maybe their nest, maybe they fly right by their nest, but um, it's not likely that they will decide, they will move with the nest is, is, is the long and short of it. Um, so if you can help it, try to leave the bird's nest exactly where it is, um, and then just wait for the nest to complete its cycle. And, you know, if it's uh, in an easy to view spot, try nest watching it. All right, and here's just a few truths uh, regarding some common mis misconceptions that we've heard over the years. Um, so first, uh, many birds think that baby birds are baby sized <laughs> and that's totally understandable. Um, you know, after all, those are pretty tiny eggs, right? 
uh, and that's true while they're in the nest, um, but birds grow fast and they fledge near adult size. Sometimes they're even heavier than the adults since the adults have been exhausting themselves to keep up with that incredible growth rate. And all they're doing, you know, all the chicks are doing is they're sitting there and they're eating and eating and eating and eating. So um, I've also heard some birds are, or some folks are for to refer to birds as pregnant <laughs> or um, otherwise assume that birds have a belly full of eggs that they lay all at once. <laughs> and I get it. It's totally understandable viewpoint. Um, the truth is though, that a lot of songbirds create and lay one egg per day. Um, and it only takes about 18 hours for that egg to form, sometimes longer or shorter in other species. Um, as the egg cell passes through the bird's oviduct, the yolk and the albumin are formed, and then the shell is formed around it all. And then eventually the egg is laid in the nest. Then the process starts all over again until the entire clutch is laid. So if you've got a bluebird and, you know, you see six eggs in the nest, it probably took six days for all those eggs to be laid. Next, um, birds do not use their nests all year round. Staying in one place for nesting is extremely risky, especially because they draw attention to themselves every time they leave the nest. So they birds try to reduce the time they spend in one spot to avoid the notice of predators. Remember, um, a lot of birds migrate or move to other habitats to spend the winter. Um, and so, you know, if they're migrating, they're not using that nest they use in the summertime, right? Um, that said, some birds will use cavities and nest boxes for shelter in harsh winter weather. Um, those are called roost boxes, or you know, you can use just a regular nest box that's been left up over the winter can be used by birds that are residents and just trying to find a little bit of shelter for the, those harsh winter nights. Um, but overall, nests are usually just a place where they're raising their young. They use them for just those couple of weeks and they move on either to a new cavity or um, to lay another clutch of eggs. And finally, um, like I said earlier, it's unfortunately true that nest failure is really common for birds. Um, it's one of the reasons why birds lay so many eggs and have multiple broods per season. Um, it, you know, the birds are kind of trying to give themselves as many chances as possible to pass on their genes, um, despite those inevitable losses that they're going to experience. So, you know, they might not be um, specifically thinking that, but um, that's kind of how they've evolved, right? They're, the more eggs they lay, the more likely at least some of them will survive to adulthood, um, but you know they can't lay so many that they're going to exhaust themselves uh, growing and laying them. Birding. I think this is something that a lot of you are familiar with, so I'll try to go over it pretty quickly. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying there's a few tips for folks in this, this section of my presentation. Um, I'll have a few tips for folks that are generally interested in birding. So, um, we all know birding is the activity of watching and observing birds. Um, some folks consider birding to be a more active form of bird watching, where bird watchers might watch birds passively for simple enjoyment. Birders are often looking to record species and how often, you know, how many birds they see. They might take special trips, that kind of thing, but it really doesn't matter. They're interchangeable, um, as, as you all know. Um, if you've been watching birds for a really long time, regardless of what kind of bird you are, you might have a life list, um, a record of all the bird species you've ever seen. Um, not everybody has one, and that's totally fine. Um, these lists are often informal. The rules for which species are included vary between individuals. Um, some people go a step farther to keep track of how many bird species they see per year, per state, per county. Um, we got a lot of folks like that at the lab, understandably so. Um, and it's all really, really just fun ways to, to explore the hobby. Um, but any way you participate, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, there is, a, I was also going to share a little bit of stats here. There are people out there that make it a mission to find as many species as possible in a certain time frame. So a man from the Netherlands, um, I'm not sure when I made this presentation, I think fall last year, um, so only a couple of months ago, at that time, a man from Netherlands currently held the world record for the number of bird species seen in one year with 6,852 species. Um, so that's a lot since there's only 10,000 in the world. I say only, that's a lot, almost 70%, um, all in just one year. I don't know if anybody anybody beat that in 2022, but that was the record for 20, up to 2021. Um, so I heard it mentioned earlier, eBird, 
It's uh, probably one of the most uh, familiar projects that um, folks know about that comes from the Cornell Lab. Um, it's a powerful tool for birders. eBird allows you to record the species you see. It keeps track of where and when you reported your birds so you can generate your life list um, according to all sorts of metrics. And it allows you to attach sound and photos to your reports. Um, eBird is available online at eBird.org and there's a mobile app. Um, on that note, there's mobile apps available for Feeder Watch and Nest Watch as well. Um, but back to eBird, um, it's a really, really great way to um, organize yourself if you are looking to make those um, those lists that I was referring to. And here on the bottom here, uh, Merlin Bird ID, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Merlin is sort of like a pared down version of eBird where um, it's meant mainly to help folks get, um, to introduce folks to birding, help them identify the birds they're seeing um, by, you know, asking you just a couple of questions about the bird. You know, what color was it? Um, where was it? What was it doing? You know, what date and where are you? And it'll give you a list of species. Merlin also has the photo option, um, which is great. Uh, you know, you upload a photo and it, uh, the AI, the, um, the, the programming can help it help you identify the bird from the picture. And then last year, we also released the, um, the sound recording part of Merlin, which uh, is super cool. You press press record when you're out in the woods, you hear the birds and the app will identify what it can. Um, these are not 100% um, certain, or sorry, these are going to be correct, but I think it's somewhere 80 to 90% um, of the time, especially if you got a nice clear sound with uh, no background noise. Um, but the sound recording part, I will say, is only available in some regions. So we've got bird packs all over the world for um, most parts of Merlin, but the sound I think there was they're still working on for some areas. Um, eBirds resources are really, really helpful if you're looking for specific species, um, if you want to just explore. Um, millions of people all over the world participate, and so you can use eBird tools to look at up every reported sighting of American robins. You can use their hotspot tool to view areas where the most birds are reported, um, or you can even check out their science section um, to see population density and trends. They just released some really cool status and trends uh, tools for a lot of species in the U.S. and Canada. Um, I love using eBird to explore potential birding spots when I'm planning a vacation or to look up where certain species have been seen lately. So um, recently this summer I went to a conference in Puerto Rico and was able to use eBird to kind of plan out where I wanted to, to spend my free time birding. Um, here are all the hotspots um, in the world. This is just a screenshot from the Explore hotspots pay, uh, link there that was showed on the last page. Um, this is hotspots based on uh, what people have observed and reported. So um, the lighter areas on the map are not necessarily devoid of birds. You can see there's some light areas in the Amazon uh, region in, in South America, um, but that could just represent the fact that there's no people there to record on eBird, right? <laughs> there's probably not a lot of people that live in the Amazon that have um, the eBird app on their phone if they even have a phone, right? It's a lot of uh, explorers, vacationers, adventurers that might be in there. And that's my, why there's some some red uh, spots in there. But also, you know, the Sahara Desert, there's probably not a, a ton of birds out there. So that, that blank space looks a little bit um, more accurate. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, the, so you know, in short, some areas are just really um, inaccessible to eBirders, so. Overall, though, it's a pretty good representation of, of hotspots where you can find a lot of species of birds. If you zoom in on that map, um, so you can see here, we've got Oneida Lake is in the middle and up on the left, that blue area is um, Ontario. Um, right in the middle of the page should be Syracuse. Um, I've used the tools and the filters on that map to view all of the sightings of bald eagles in the Syracuse area in March, 2021, um, which must have been when I uh, screenshot of this. <laughs> the red markers indicate recent sightings. So if I wanted to try to find a bald eagle, I could zoom in to see where eagles were seen recently and to try to find one myself. Um, but 
a quick note here too, eBird will hide the recent reports of sensitive species um, to help reduce that unnecessary disturbance. So some of the owl species like snowy owls, um, endangered species, uh, birds like that, um, you might not be able to use this tool for, for those, but um, you know, if you're, let's say you're looking for evening grosbeaks, right? You could type in evening grosbeak, adjust the dates to, you know, January, 2022, and then it would, sorry, 2023. And, um, it would show you all the recent spots where that species has been seen in our area. So super helpful if you're like, you know what, I haven't seen this bird yet, where it's been seen recently, eBird can, can help guide you. Um, yep, so this is back to uh, that, that um, page I just had up. Um, if eBird seems like it's a bit too much, it's a little bit, too complicated for you right now, that's totally okay. As I said before, um, Merlin is a really great option. Um, again, they've got either the five easy questions, the photo ID tool, or the sound ID tool. I'm sorry, the dogs are getting a little bit feisty. <laughs> um, I highly recommend Merlin for anyone who wants to get better identifying birds or who just wants to have a quick reference guide when they're out in the field. The Merlin team is still working on filling in those gaps, like I said before, um, but they can help you identify over 7,500 species. So about 75%. Alrighty. So that is about it for me. Um, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm sorry if any um, questions came through, I wasn't able to see that, but I'm going to uh, share some, share my screen so I can show you some of those tools that we were talking about. Um, let's see here. Alrighty. So we'll start with the common feeder birds. This is what it looks like. Um, you can see on the left here, you've got the region, your food type, and your feeder type. So if we use this filter to the northeast, and let's say I'm providing, yeah, black hour, black oil sunflower seeds, and we're putting them on the ground. Maybe we don't even have a feeder. We're just spreading sunflower seeds on the ground. You can kind of see that this species list changed as I move those filters. And you scroll down and here's some common species um, that would come to that, that kind of feeder setup. And granted, you know, um, it's kind of general. So gray jay, which is a Canada jay actually now, um, is listed on this list, but um, you know, not every state in the, that northeast section um, on the map here in the filter is going to get a gray jay, oh, sorry, Canada jay. But um, if you do live in the gray jay range, then uh, it's possible they'll come to that feeder setup. And so the other thing I wanted to show was if you click, let's say, a common red pole, kind of a fun species that um, comes south every few couple of or every few years. I think a few years ago we had a whole bunch that came down from the boreal forests of Canada. Um, if you click on the species, you get a really nice close up. And if you scroll down, you can see the winter regions where they're often seen when they do um, when they come south. The food types you can put out to help attract them. So mainly sunflower seeds and Niger, and then a whole bunch of different kinds of feeders. Um, that these birds have been known to come to. So platform feeders, tube feeders, hoppers, um, spreading seed on the ground. And then on the bottom, we've got this nice little link to the All About Birds page, which if you just search common red pole on Google, it's one of the first results. And this goes to another page with even more information. So lots of different pictures. It's got um, life history information, maps, um, you can see for example, a nice range map. The orange is where they breed. The purple is where they can found, be found any time of year. And the blue um, is the winter range. The lighter blue is the, um, the areas where they're less likely to be seen. That's um, more likely during, during eruption years. All right. And then the other um, tool that I talked about was the right bird, right house. So this is um, the one that can help you find the best um, nest box for your yard. So again, we've got this nice little filter box at the top. You can choose where you live and your primary habitat. So um, right now it's just US and Canada. I'm gonna scroll down here to the Northeast. And we've got um, state codes here as well in case you're 
you're living in a spot where it's, you know, right on the cusp of a different region and your primary habitat, um, you know, pick, you can usually toggle between these. So let's say you live in a forested area. Um, you're surrounded by a lot of trees in your yard. Click see results. And there's 20 different species that would come to, to nest structures that are installed in that kind of area. So robins, barred owls, chickadees. Um, we've got helpful little tips to show you what, which species are in decline. And that's according to um, breeding bird survey data. Um, there's a whole bunch of different options. I'll go into the, um, let's see, the black capped chickadee. And on the species page, um, there's this nice green button here that allows you to download the construction plan. It's a preview here of what it looks like will pop up for you. You scroll down, if it's a species that's in decline, um, you'll see a map that shows what regions it is declining. So it's not specifically the state, but that region, the overall decline is present. Um, gray means that it's present, but not declining according to uh, that reading bird survey data by the USGS. We've got um, breeding range on the left, ideal habitat on the right, and where you should attach the box. So chickadees will come to boxes that are attached to buildings, to posts, to poles, um, trees. There's a known nesting period. So you can see that um, if you've, you probably ideally want to have a nest box out prior to this green bar. So if you're looking to attract chickadees this year, try to get your box installed before the end of March. Um, you'll have the most, uh, you'll have better luck attracting the bird um, instead of if you've, you know, installed it in the middle of May when they're already in the middle of nesting, right? Then we've got nest box placement. Just a couple of more things on this is um, the height, minimum spacing. So if you've got, you want to attract more than one chickadee box, uh, sorry, chickadee pair to your boxes, they have to be at least 650 feet apart. Um, ideally, they should be facing away from prevailing winds. We've got some ideal measurements. They're not, you know, be all end alls, but um, there's, you know, an inch and, a, and an eighth is an ideal entrance box, uh, entrance hole size for black cap chickadees. Um, the depth should be around eight inches. It can be a little bit more, it might be a little bit less, but in general, that seems to, to work well for them. And um, the uh, length and width are five and a half inches or so. And at the bottom, um, different species have different helpful tips. Um, for this one, um, it's helpful to add wood shavings to the bottom of the box if you want to attract the chickadee. Um, bluebirds don't need that though, right? So they'll have other tips in this section. So these are really, really helpful pages. Um, and I just wanted to share how fun and easy they were to uh, explore. So with that, I'm gonna end, um, end my talk here and I'll take any questions that folks have. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> Excellent talk, Holly, thanks so much. Yeah. I know it's hard to figure out, you know, how in the weeds I really want to get with this stuff sometimes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's tons of really great information and I'm sure people have maybe some questions, but you covered so much good stuff. Great. Yeah. So I don't know if people want to raise their hands or if they don't want to just shout out their question. I can do it either way. Oh, Holly. Yeah. Um, hi. Just real quick. Someone told me that it's okay to put out like <clears throat> dryer lint for birds during the nesting period? Is it true? That's a really great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, we actually have a blog post about this on the Nest Watch page um, of ideal nesting materials. So in short, no, <laughs> I'd rather, it, it better not to. Um, what we try to recommend folks do is provide um, materials that they're most likely to find in nature, right? You want to be mimicking that natural experience. So, um, you know, untreated grass clippings, um, twigs, you know, if you're kind of gathering natural materials, that's a great way to provide um, materials for birds to, to build their nests with. But dryer lint can also, can often have, um, you know, detergent residue. Sometimes, um, you know, there might be long stringy items in that dryer lint. Um, there's other chemicals that can be in there that, you know, we don't, I don't know of any studies that have been done on whether that's, you know, necessarily bad for birds, but, um, you know, 
those soaps and chemicals might irritate the um, delicate skin of those nestlings too. So, you know, when in doubt, we've just kind of recommend uh, better to provide the natural stuff. Thanks for asking. Thanks. I will I appreciate add, that. I will add that I worked at a rehab center for a while and we got in nestlings with that that were stuck to their nest from human hair pretty regularly. And so if hair gets in your dryer lint, that could be a serious problem. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's, you know, another common question we get is, you know, I have sheep, can I provide that hair? It's not necessarily a bad thing, but again, you know, think about the, the chemical treatments you put in the wool, you know, are those, is it natural? Um, if it's long haired wool, you want to make sure you're cutting that into, you know, lengths of one inch or less to prevent exactly that problem, right? You don't want them stuck in the nest. Um, you know, birds will naturally grab hairs of animals like horse hair and that kind of thing. So, you know, again, it's, it's not, something you can 100% prevent, but um, the less that you make that available to them, the better. And Holly, there is one question in the chat from Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, it says, will sharp-shinned hawks attack dark-eyed juncos and scare them and the rest of the birds from returning to feeders? Or it sounds like she doesn't, she's missing birds from her feeders. So she was also okay. wondering, could warmer no snow weather be the reason I haven't been seeing my regulars at my feeders yes that's a great great question yeah so hawks um will scare birds from feeders but usually it doesn't scare them away for a long amount of time um you know at the most maybe a couple of hours depending on how um how vigilant that hawk is right <laughs> um hawks actually might be more common when it's snowy out because um what they normally eat um, they'll have birds and sometimes small mammals, and they're not going to see those small mammals if there's a lot of snow on the ground, right? Um, so uh, to answer your question, though, probably the reason you're not seeing a lot right now is, again, you know, they don't have a lot of snow on the ground. Um, there's a lot of natural food sources still available. Um, like I said, fall is a good time for um, plants going to seed and berries being produced. And this time of the winter, you know, we haven't seen a lot of harsh weather yet. So those those sources haven't really been picked dry or, you know, picked till they're empty. Um, so that's my my guess. Uh, my feeders have also been kind of kind of low, um, but I've also not been filling them as often as I used to as well. So there's a lot of different factors that can kind of be at play, but weather is usually a big one. You know, if we get a cold snap here pretty soon and you see, um, I think, I know Ithaca is due for a little bit of snow, not a ton, um, but as soon as you start, see those flakes start falling, you're going to see the birds come back to your feeders. Different times of the day, they can also come too. I know my mom always tells me she's out at 3 p.m. and the, all the, the birds, you know, swarm her feeders at that time of day. <laughs> I see if I, I think I have another um, a direct message here too, but it was, I think it's the same one here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if you send them to your, your chat here, um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as well. I was wondering, you mentioned that squirrels are hard to keep away, but what about other things like deer and raccoons? Should be people be working hard to prevent them from eating their um, bird seed or what should they do about that? Yeah, so as fun as it is to see those other species, right? We don't want to um, help them learn that your house is a good place for food, right? I mean, it, it's kind of silly, right? Because you're thinking about birds. Yes, you want them to come, but you don't want the mammals to come. Um, it's a weird balance for sure, but I would say, um, like I said, you know, adding those predator guards can help um, installing taller poles to hold your feeders, um, you know, depending on your ability to get up and refill them, right? But um, trying to do your best to discourage other animals from getting into that is probably going to be, it's going to be a good thing for them and for you. We all know that, you know, a fed bear is a dead bear, right? So we don't, you, it, um, one of the other things that Feeder Watch stresses upon people is if you live in an area with bears, like a lot of us do, um, it's best not to have your feeders out when the the bears are not hibernating, um, especially if you know that the bears are regular in your area, right? If you're in the middle of suburbia, in the middle of Syracuse, you're probably okay. <laughs> but if you live in the outskirts and, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're not attracting unwanted wildlife or ones that could get harmed um, from coming to your yard or you get harmed too. Hope that's a good answer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, excellent. It looks like people are getting tired, um, <laughs> but thank you so much, Holly. That was so much great information and so many good things that we can be um, putting to use from coming out of Cornell. Yeah. I definitely have to say I 
just recently started using Merlin at the end of the summer and it was really a, a game changer. Even if you are good at bird calls, it's kind of nice to like, when you're not 100% sure to double check <laughs> with Merlin to give you that like extra confidence. So um, for those more advanced birders, it's still useful for you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I use Merlin, you know, it's, it's meant for folks getting into it, but I mean, a lot of us folks that are used to birding and, you know, we've been doing it for 10 years or more, um, you know, it's a really great tool. Like you said, you know, to help you confirm what you're thinking or it picks up something and you're like, wait, oh, you know what? I do hear that warbler, you know, something you might not have heard if you weren't, um, seeing that. So it's, it's, it's nice. It's, it's definitely a helpful tool. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I just put um, my email, the, the Nest Watch email in the chat as well. So if anybody has follow up questions, especially during this nesting season, email it directly um, and we, we monitor it Monday through Friday. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, thanks Molly. John. And everyone get on Nest Watch next year and Breeding Bird Atlas. You can mm -hmm. combine them together. <laughs> All sorts of good stuff. <laughs> yes. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thanks, Dory. Thank and we'll be in touch really soon. All right. Sounds good. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.